This week is Parshas Chaye Sara, and I'm very excited to share with y'all two amazing, though totally unrelated ideas that I actually heard last year on this week on Parshas Chaye Sara, and I've been itching to share it with y'all. I've been waiting for this moment, for the opportunity to share these two ideas with you on the Parsha podcast. The second verse in this week's Parsha, of course, the Parsha begins with the passing and the funeral arrangements of Sarah. Sarah dies. She's 127 years old. And the second verse we read that Sarah died in Tiryas Arba, the city called Tiryas Arba, which is Hebron, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to bewail her. So we're told that Sarah died. And where she died? She died in Tiryas Arba, which is also called Hebron, which is in the city of, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn her, to bewail her, to eulogize her, and to cry over her. And then, of course, it goes on to the whole negotiations that Abraham makes with Ephron, who is the owner of the cave in which Abraham wants to bury Sarah, and eventually they strike a deal. So I want to examine this verse, verse number two of the Parsha. So it's interesting, you know, Sarah died, we're told her age, and we're also told the location of her passing. Moreover, we're told multiple names of the city in which she passed. She died in Kiryas Arba, which is also called Hebron, which is also Hebron. Now, at the end of the Parsha, we find out that Abraham passes as well. But if you examine those verses, we're not told where he died. We're just told his age, and we're told that he passed away. He was gathered into his elders, into his ancestors, but we're not told the location of his passing. Yet for some reason, there's a need with the passing of Sarah to be told the location of her passing. Moreover, we're given very specific details, almost extra details of the various names of the place of her passing. It's almost like if someone passes away in Chicago, they'll say, oh, they passed away in Chicago, which is also called the Windy City. Philadelphia, which is also called the city of brotherly love. Houston, which is also Space City. We know the Torah doesn't give us extra information needlessly. So why does the Torah find the need to give us the location of Sarah's passing? And more specifically, why do we need to be told two of the names of that particular location? So there's an amazing insight from the Kliyakra, one of the commentaries on the Torah. He tells us that the Midrash tells us that actually this city, the city called Tiras Arba and Hebron, in scripture actually has Four different names. In addition to Kiris Arba and to Hebron, it has the names of Eshkol and Mamre. And that, of course, adds another wrinkle to the whole dilemma. You know, why does there need to be four different names for this one city? So he suggests an amazing insight. He says that the city of Hebron, this particular city, was designated as a burial place. Of course, the most famous aspect the most famous tourist attraction in the city of Hebron is the Cave of the Patriarchs. You, you can still go visit it today. But we know in general that this city in general was designated for burial spots. And in fact, the verse in the Book of Numbers tells us that Hebron was built seven years before a certain city in Egypt called Soan. And Rashi tells us what is the connection between the city of Hebron and the city of Soan in Egypt – it's coming to tell us, Rashi quotes this from our sages, it's coming to tell us the praise of the land of Israel. Because the city of Hebron, there is no city that is less conducive to agriculture than the city of Hebron in the land of, of Canaan. Why? It's a very rocky location. It doesn't have the characteristics for good agriculture. And therefore, that particular city was designated to bury the dead. You don't need to have very luscious, very fertile land to have a graveyard, to have a cemetery. And in the land of Egypt, the best land was Tzoan, and the verse is telling us that the worst land, the land of Israel, is still seven times better than the best land in the land of Egypt. So we see that this city, the city of Hebron, was always designated to be a place to bury the dead. And therefore, suggests the Kliyakar that the fact that it has four cities 
and the city itself is designated as a burial spot for the dead, it's hinting to you that there's four different reasons why people pass. You have, of course, someone who passes because their sins are numerous, are egregious. And in fact, the verse tells us that there was a man who died in his sins as a result of his sins. You have someone who sins against God and God says, okay, I want to punish you and I'm going to take your soul away. You've lost your opportunity of life. That's the first kind of person that dies. A second kind of person that dies is someone who dies not because of their own sins, but because of the sins of others. So, for example, under certain circumstances, you could have an instance where a child will die as a result of the sin of their ancestors. In addition, you also have a situation in which a tzaddik, a righteous person, is going to die for the sins of the people of their generation. So there's a different kind of reason why someone would die, and that is for the sins of others. And then you have someone who has no sin at all, and the only reason why they need to die is because everyone who is alive needs to die. And this is a theme that we find throughout Jewish literature, that whatever is composed of various parts must also be decomposed. And of course, man, humanity, really everything that is matter is comprised of the four elements. And therefore, because it's comprised of various elements, it must eventually separate. Those elements eventually must separate. And therefore, death is mandatory if you're alive. Even if you have no sins that would accelerate your death, you're eventually going to die because that is the destiny of mankind. And finally, you have the fourth level of death, And that is the death when someone is so beloved by God, God is so desirous of their soul that he takes their soul out of love to bring his soul close to him in heaven. And corresponding to these four types of death, we have the four names of the city of Hebron. So he starts off with Mamre. Mamre is one of the four cities. Again, there's Mamre, Eshtol, Kiryas Arba, and Hebron. Mamre, the word Mamre in Hebrew means rebellion. So, for example, when Moses is berating the people before he dies, he tells them that your whole life you have been rebellious with God. In addition, there's a law of a zakein mamre, that's a rebellious elder, a judge that refuses to adhere to the ruling of the grand Sanhedrin. So, the word mamre means rebellion, and when the city of Hebron is called mamre, it's a reference to death because of rebellion, because of sin. And then the next name is Eshkol. The word Eshkol appears in the Torah, for example, in the story that we're going to read next week's Parsha, and that is when Rebecca wants to send Jacob away, she's worried that Esau is going to kill him. She says, Lama Eshkol gam shnechem yom echad. Why should I lose both you and your brother in one day? And that's a reference to someone who, God forbid, tragically has to bury their own children. And and thus, that would be, of course, a punishment for the parent, and that would be indicative of perhaps some sin that is the lot of the parent, and thus the term eshkol applies to death due to the sins of others. And then you have Kiryas Arba. The word Arba, of course, in Hebrew means four. Everyone who is comprised of four elements has to eventually decompose. Those elements have to separate, and thus they have to die. And that is the name applied to the kind of death in which someone who has no sin, but after all, they're human, and a human needs to die, and therefore the four are eventually separated and the person passes. And finally, the word chevron, from the word chaver, which means friend or connection, that refers to the holiest of the righteous people who have no sins at all, who God is desirous of, who God loves, who God wants to have close to him, and thus they die because God wants to have their soul in proximity to him in heaven. And here we have Sarah. Sarah apparently dies before her time. She dies young. She dies suddenly. And you may think that maybe she died because of her sins comes along the verse and tells us, no, she died in Kiryas Arba, which is Hebron. She did not die as a result of sin, not her sin, not the sin of others. She only died because she was human. 
Moreover, because of Hebron, she was beloved by God and God wanted her soul. This is a very clever resolution to a problematic verse, but I think the lesson for us is is very powerful that, of course, people, everyone dies and the death is going to be a result of one of these four reasons. Of course, we're striving that our death should be of the highest variety in which our soul is so perfect, our soul is so refined, we've fulfilled our mission in life and God is desirous of our soul and, of course, we should strive for that kind of life resulting in that kind of transition to the spiritual world. And I think also that, you know, when someone righteous dies, everyone asks the obvious question, why did God do this? And of course, that's a very broad subject, very difficult subject to unpack. But the question has an assumption. When we ask the question, you know, someone who's righteous, why did they die? We're assuming there's only one reason why someone dies because they deserved it because they were sinful. And here we find out that there's really a variety of reasons why someone would pass. Some of them are negative. Some of them are quite the contrary, are quite positive. Because they're righteous, they passed. Because they're righteous and their soul is so pure, God desired their soul and that's why they died. I think it's a very valuable insight that we learn from the second verse of our Parsha. I want to fast forward to the end of the Parsha Chapter 25, verse 1, this is after Isaac secures a wife in Rebekah, that whole elaborate story when Eliezer is sent back to Abraham's hometown to find Abraham's relative, Rebekah, who is shown to be a great candidate to join the empire of kindness of Abraham. And she is brought back to Isaac. Isaac marries her. Isaac loves her. And the very next verse tells us that Abraham after the passing of his wife, Sarah, he also found a second wife, Keturah. And the verse goes on to tell us that that union spawned six sons. It's actually an interesting trivia question. You know, how many children did Abraham have? Scripture tells us that Abraham actually had eight children. Of course, you have Isaac and Ishmael, and then you have the six sons born with Keturah. Now, who is this Keturah character? So Rashi tells us that this is actually none other than Hagar, the same maidservant of Sarah, who Sarah initially gave to Abraham to have a child, and Ishmael was born. And then once Isaac was born, Ishmael and Hagar were banished. Now Abraham is remarrying Hagar. Now she's called Keturah after Sarah had passed. And why is she called Keturah? Why is her name being changed? So Rashi gives us two reasons why Hagar is now called Keturah. Number one, because the word Keturah means that she tied herself up. And that's to indicate that after she departed from Abraham, she was celibate. And that is a testament to her righteousness that once she departed Abraham, she wasn't with any other man, and therefore Abraham remarried her. In addition, Rashi tells us, why is Hagar called Keturah? Because her deeds are as beloved as Ketores. The word Ketores means incense, which is one of the offerings brought every day in the tabernacle and subsequently the temple. It is an incense offering. It's a variety of spices and herbs that are burned on the inner altar once a year on Yom Kippur. They're also burned in the Holy of Holies on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that was one of the offerings in the temple, the tabernacle. It's considered a very beautiful, very beloved offering. And that is compared to Hagar. Hagar is so righteous Her deeds are so beautiful, they are like Ketores, they're like the incense, and therefore her name is Keturah after the Ketores. That's what Rashi tells us. Now, it is kind of odd if you think about it. You know, of all the compliments that could be given to Hagar, she's so righteous, she is so worthy, her deeds are so refined like the Ketores, Of all the things to compliment someone, this is such an unusual compliment. 
that she is compared to the incense offering in the tabernacle and the temple. She's not compared to any other sacrifice. Why specifically do our sages, Rashi and does the Torah, compare Hagar to the incense? What is significant about the incense that it really directly relates to Hagar? So I heard a fantastic explanation again last year that I have been chambering since then to share it with y'all today. So the Katores is a potpourri of all kinds of herbs and spices. It was burned twice a day in Jerusalem, and the smell wafted throughout the whole region that the Talmud tells us that the goats in Jericho, many miles away, they would sneeze from the smell of the Katores. Moreover, the women in Jericho, they would not need to put on any perfume because the the wonderful smell, the aroma of the Katores, of the incense, that would perfume everyone and there was no need to add any additional perfume because the Katores had that covered. Moreover, a Kala, a bride in Jerusalem, they used to, brides used to adorn themselves with various kinds of spices and perfume. They wouldn't need to do that because the smell of the Ketores was so powerful, the aroma really covered everything, that there was no need to add any additional perfume. Now, our sages tell us that this Ketores was a concoction of 11 different spices and herbs. And one of them, we're told quite interestingly, one of them, the chelbana, was actually quite malodorous. It smelled repugnant. It was terrible on its own in isolation. But together with the 10 other spices, it created a total experience that was quite delightful and fantastic. Why did you add the chelbana, this one particular bad spice, to the total concoction, to the cocktail of the Ketores? So Rashi tells us in the book of Exodus, in chapter 30, I believe it is, that this is to indicate that the Jewish people, you know, we're a collection of really righteous people, and of course we have a handful of non-righteous people, and the whole concoction together, the Jewish people, we have to be taken together. If we're going to pray, we got to make sure that even the wicked people are praying with us. If we're fasting, we have to make sure that even the wicked people are fasting with us. Only when we have all these spices, the good and the bad, together can we create the Ketores. But the insight here is that despite the fact that this chelbana, this particular spice or herb called chelbana, on its own reeked with a rancid odor, once it was mixed with the other elements of the concoction, the total result was fantastic, was wonderful. Perhaps this can be applied to Hagar. You know, Hagar, she was dealt with the most difficult parenting responsibility, maybe of all time. Before her son was born, before Ishmael was born, an angel foretold that he will be a wild man, his hand in all, everyone is hands on him, he's going to be a loose cannon, and he's going to be a mess. He's going to be very earthly, he's going to be very frivolous, he's going to have the worst kind of impulses. And as a child, he's already veering in that direction. He's already involved in the worst sins possible. He has a penchant for idolatry, for adultery, for murder, he's trying to murder Isaac, Things got so bad that Abraham and Sarah, who welcomed everyone, even the worst kind of guest, was welcome to their home, they had to banish their own child or their own stepchild, Ishmael, from their home because he was so bad. And what happened to Ishmael? So later on in this week's Parsha, we find out that Ishmael repented. Why? Rashi tells us that by Abraham's funeral... Isaac and Ishmael buried him. And the fact that it precedes Isaac to Ishmael, it shows that even though Ishmael was older, he yielded, he ceded, he allowed Isaac to go first. He acknowledged Isaac's supremacy. And consequently, that's indicative that he repented. But already in last week's Parsha, when it talks about 
the binding of Isaac, we know that Abraham went with Isaac and his two lads with him. Who are those two lads? So Rashi tells us that's Eliezer and Ishmael. So Ishmael was banished, but he was already welcomed back. He had rejoined Abraham's household. How did that happen? How do you have a child that the angel prophesied that he's going to be a wild animal? And we see already at a very young age a tendency towards the worst kind of sins. How does he suddenly become righteous? How does he, you know, when we left him, he was in Egypt, he became an archer, he got married to an Egyptian. It seems like his role in the story was over. His die was cast. His destiny was to be that of a sinner in Egypt. And suddenly he's back with Abraham. And suddenly we find out Rashi tells us that he became righteous. How did that happen? Here we find out the answer. Hagar, she was like the Keturah. She's called Keturah. She knew that she had certain elements in in the child that she was given, that there's nothing you can do about them, they were rancid. They smelled terrible. They were malodorous. They were repugnant. They were like the Chalbana. But she knew, like a talented spice master, like a talented perfumer, she knew which other spices to add to the cauldron, which other buttons to push so that the total result would be something aromatic and lovely, and indeed, he repented. Ishmael indeed had certain parts of his character that on their own were were deadly, were something that even Abraham couldn't handle. Abraham's told by God, send him away. He's a bad influence. The angel indeed foretold he's going to be a sinner. He's going to have tendencies that are very bad and very wild. He's going to be the loose cannon. And the result of it is that he became righteous. How did that happen? Because Hagar was the spice master. She was like the Ketores. She knew how to parent him in a way. She knew which other ingredients to add to the cauldron so that the total result was something very delightful. And maybe when we look at his story, we could maybe pinpoint what those themes were. Ishmael, he's the child of Abraham. And when Abraham had those three guests come visit, of course, it turns out they're angels. But at the beginning of Parsha's Vayir, beginning of Lashish Parsha, we read how he gives the meat to the lad to process. Rashi tells us that that is Ishmael. Abraham's trying to train him in the ways of kindness. And then we read it a little bit later on. Abraham is 99 years old and he circumcises himself. And who else circumcises himself at that time? Ishmael at the age of 13. Even though he could have refused, even though he could have said, I'm not interested in doing this surgery, Ishmael was trained on the ways of self-sacrifice by the story of the circumcision. And later on, after he's already banished, we see that he prays. We see that his mother prays for him. We're, we're, we're witnessing over here the re-education, so to speak, of Ishmael. We're witnessing various other characteristics being thrown in to the pot and to the cauldron. Yes, his rage, his penchant for sin, certain malodorous aspects of his character were fixed. But you threw in some kindness. You throw in some prayer. You throw in some sacrifice. All that joins the mix, and that results in him becoming righteous anew and being welcomed back into the graces of Abraham. I think this is a very powerful idea for parents, but even for anyone trying to you know, train themselves, train a child, train a charge, a pupil. There are certain parts of our character that are fixed. We believe that, of course, every person is given a catalog of good and bad character. But there are certain parts of your character that you really can change. If someone you know, is very aggressive and very active and very animated and very rambunctious as a child, you can't really get that child, at least without without ruining them completely. You can't transform that child into a bookworm who just wants to sit back nicely and listen to what the teacher has to say. You can't do that. You have to try to direct the child, given the certain parts of their character that are immutable, that are unchanging, what else can I add to this mixture? How else can I manipulate 
the circumstances that are fixed and how could I result in bringing out the power and the beauty of this particular child? And of course, like we said, it applies with ourselves as well. There's certain parts of our life, of our character, we can't change. But everyone can be righteous. The Raman tells us everyone could be as righteous as Moses because no matter how bad those characteristics that you have in isolation, there is a concoction. There is a cocktail that can bring out the best of each and every one of us. And Hagar here, she's the, you know, she's the prototype. She's the example of someone who was dealt a child that most of us would probably have given up on. This kid's guy, he's so rotten. He is, there's, there's no hope for him. He's going to end up as a total sinner and a murderer and an idolater and a rapist. He is really headed down that path. And you know what? That would be a true assessment. But Hagar believed in him. She understood this principle of the Ketores that even if you have things that are foul smelling, that are rancid, that are repugnant, there is a way to manipulate the situation. There are other ingredients that you could add that will result in something very delightful and very wonderful and very aromatic. And hopefully all of us will be successful in our own parenting and in our own self-training to make ourselves better people. And I appreciate you listening and downloading. Please share the Parsha podcast with a friend. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. If you have not yet come to the Torch website, torchweb.org, and submitted your order for a free Torch Shabbat light switch cover, please do so. Again, we're shipping them out every day all over the world. I thank you so much for your listenership. Email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you soon.